even if this was a liberalizing force, and even if this was uh, not as bad as other slavery, do you think that the ownership of other human beings under the conditions of the Hebrew Bible are immoral? Yes. You know when someone you know just completely face plants in failure? Those moments are so painful, yet at the same time, we just can't take our eyes away from the train wreck. This is exactly how I feel about Ben Shapiro's response to an atheist on the topic of slavery in the Old Testament. Before we jump in, my name is Greg, I'm a pastor, and I'm here to help you engage the culture with the gospel. If that's something that you care about, hit the subscribe button to join me on this journey. Alex O'Connor is a professing atheist who recently challenged Shapiro on God's dealings with slavery in ancient Israel. He argues that God's lack of prohibiting slavery and God's instructions on the practice present a significant moral problem. This is a tough issue to tackle, but first I want to show where Shapiro went right, and then we'll dive into where he went wrong. Uh, as far as why didn't the Bible prescribe the perfect world as I would see it, or as you might see it, and the answer is because two, two reasons. One, as stated right up top, I'm not God. I assume he has different logic than I do. Mm -hmm. Two, the Bible is in an inherently problematic position in the sense that on the one hand, it's trying to divulge important truths for all time. At the same time, it's talking to a people of a particular time. Okay, this is really good. Here, Shapiro acknowledges that there are two kinds of commands in scripture. First, scripture has commands that are universally binding upon all of humanity for all time. And second, scripture also has commands that address particular issues of a specific historical context, which are not universally binding on all of humanity. There are contextual limits to those commands. A good example of a universal command is Exodus 20, 19, you shall not murder. And an example of a particular command that is contextually bound is Deuteronomy 22:11. You shall not wear cloth of wool and linen mixed together. The first command is aimed at a universal reality. All human life for all time is made in the image of God and is to be protected. The second command, however, is aimed at a contextual reality. It is directed towards a particular time. This is calling for ancient Israel at her time to live in such a distinct way that she provoked the surrounding nations to behold her and her God. Because we're not under the particular laws of ancient Israel today, Believers today are free to wear all of the stretchy spandex that we desire. Well, as long as you're not using that stretchy spandex to murder anyone. When it comes to slavery, it's important to remember that slavery has been the universal norm for humanity up until the 18th century, even though its forms have varied from culture to culture. Ben Shapiro notes this in his response as well. But here's where things start to take a turn for the worse. I must say that it seems strange to me that God does seem willing to completely and utterly condemn uh, a bunch of other practices, including, by the way, imaginary crimes like witchcraft, just done away with entirely. And even if it is the case that God, for some reason, couldn't just say, couldn't even hint at the idea that maybe eventually we should be moving towards the abolition of the idea of owning human beings as private property, he just had to condone it. it but, but I, yes. I still think it's the case that he would not permit a flat immorality, and I think you would agree with that too. Here, O'Connor presses Shapiro on one major question. Why does a perfectly moral God permit his people to participate in such an immoral practice? Why does a perfectly moral God condemn some things strongly, but not slavery? Shapiro answers that God's revelation enters a fallen world with sinful practices such as slavery, and that part is true, but then he says that rather than completely upheaving slavery, God chooses to woo Israel away from the sinful practice via a gradual process. This is where Shapiro makes a big mistake. Watch as O'Connor presses him on it. Even if this was a liberalizing force, and even if this was uh, not as bad as other slavery, do you think that the ownership of other human beings under the conditions of the Hebrew Bible are immoral? Yes. So how do you account for God commanding something, which you now see to be, or, or rather permitting something, and explicitly and giving you details about how to do something, which is proactively immoral. Because permitting, he's not permitting me, per permitting 
my great 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 to do something immoral to do something to do something immoral that in the time was not considered immoral it wasn't considered immoral but was it immoral now 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 who's the moral relativist by the Judeo Christian tradition sure by by today's standards developed under the Judeo Christian tradition immoral so so which by the way you're 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 living off that you're you're again not to get back to the Tom Holland argument you're living off the remains of this I mean where's your morality coming from but who's the moral relativist now Shapiro says that God gave regulations for an institution that is wrong according to today today's standards, and by doing so, he admits to being a moral relativist, someone who asserts that cultures and societies subjectively determine morality. This undermines scripture's presentation that God is eternally righteous and eternally just. His moral perfection is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So what are we supposed to do with this proposed problem. Why would a perfectly moral God give regulations for slavery in the ancient world rather than just outright condemning it? To answer this question, we must first examine the why. Why is slavery considered evil? This may seem obvious, but it's really important to evaluate. Based upon scripture, my answer is that slavery is evil because one, it is often accomplished by man-stealing, separating someone from their family. Two, it dehumanizes and devalues a person, reducing them to property. Three, slavery is evil because there are wicked masters who abuse their authority by beating them, starving them, overworking them, sexually taking advantage of them, and even killing them. And four, slavery is evil because laws give little to no legal protections for slaves who are facing injustice from their masters. Now we have to ask, does God, who is perfectly righteous for all time, explicitly address these evils in the Old Testament? And the answer is a resounding yes. First, the Bible explicitly condemns man-stealing. Exodus 21.16 declares, Whoever steals a man and sells him, and anyone found in possession of him, shall be put to death. Second, the Bible explicitly condemns dehumanizing people because they are made in the image of God. Genesis 1.27 proclaims, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. This is a foundational text that defines exactly why humanity has far more value than any other creature, something that atheists struggle to explain. The reality of the Imago Dei provides the moral grounding for why it is always wrong to dehumanize another image bearer of God. Third, the Bible explicitly condemns abusive authority. Look at passages like Exodus 22, 21 through 24. You shall not wrong a sojourner or oppress him, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry and my wrath will burn and I will kill you with the sword and your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. Yeah. God doesn't care about injustice. Or check out passages like Zechariah 7, 9 through 10. Thus says the Lord of hosts, render true judgments, show kindness and mercy to one another. Do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor, and let none of you devise evil against another in your heart. Or check out Proverbs 6, 16 through 19. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. Throughout the entire Old Testament, God makes it clear that the abusive use of authority is to have no place in Israel. Those who do such things will face his judgment. Lastly, the Bible explicitly condemns all forms of injustice, especially injustice towards those who have the lowest standing in society. Listen to passages like Leviticus 19.15. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. Or look at Proverbs 31, 8 through 9. Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. 
Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. Or look at Amos 5.24. But let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. So to recap, the Bible explicitly condemns man-stealing, dehumanization, abuse of authority, and injustice of any kind. So while you cannot say that the Bible explicitly condemns slavery, you can say that the Bible explicitly condemns everything that makes slavery evil. To help drive this point home, I want to propose a scenario. What if the master did not steal their slave, but the slave was someone who willingly joined themselves to the master for their care and provision? What if the master did not dehumanize their slave, but valued and exalted them as a unique person made in the image of God? What if the master did not abuse his slave, but lavished him and greatly cared for him? And what if the master did not deprive his slave of justice, but made sure that he was protected and defended? If slavery looked like this, could the atheist really say that slavery in and of itself is evil, especially if everything that makes slavery evil was removed? Now, I recognize that this is a picture of slavery that is unheard of, and I recognize that many gross evils have been carried out under the banner of slavery. But what I'm driving home is the Old Testament's point that what makes slavery evil is not the master-slave relationship in and of itself, but the wicked heart of humanity. Abuse of authority is not only found in the master-slave relationship. It's found among employers, elected officials, and all positions of power. Because of our sinful hearts, it is the nature of sinful humanity to abuse power of any kind. Now, this is really important. What the Bible calls for in response to man's wickedness is not the removal of power and authority, but for one who will use their power and authority to establish God's righteousness on the earth. This is why we desperately need Jesus. He is the promised master who laid down his life to redeem for himself a beloved people of his own possession. As truly God and truly man, Jesus died on the cross for our unrighteousness and rose from the dead to give us new life in him. And one day he is coming again to bring judgment upon all evildoers and to rule over his people in everlasting righteousness. In scripture, God doesn't condemn the master-slave relationship. He promises to redeem it by providing a perfect and loving master, the only perfect and loving master himself. This is why Christians in the New Testament are called slaves of Christ. Similarly, those who rebel against God are called slaves of sin. As sinners, all of us want to be masters of our own lives. But the truth is, everyone is a slave of some kind. Either you are a slave of sin, or you are a slave of Christ. Sin is a cruel master that will curse you, abuse you, and destroy you. But Jesus is a loving master who will love you, care for you, and provide for you for all of your days. Which master will you choose? May you choose Jesus as your master, the only master who can set you free from the enslavement of sin. And may you live out your created purpose to worship our great, holy, and triune God.